live from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. It's the Science Cafe with your host, Chris Smith. All right, everybody. Good evening, everyone. Hi, welcome to the Science Cafe. Thank you so much for coming out this evening for tonight's program. My name is Chris. I'm your host every Thursday night for the Science Cafe here in the Daily Planet Cafe. We put on a great show every week. There's always something new to learn, a new scientist, researcher, practitioner to meet. And if you come to Science Cafes often, you know that I will give you an honorary PhD in everythingness. And or something like that. Nobody has told me I can do that, but I'll just say that I can. And the people with PhDs in the room just grimaced at me because they're like, no, it's harder than that. Anyway. Well, welcome. Thanks for coming out tonight. Tonight we're going to be talking about eyes, which I'm going to let you in on a secret about me. If you say the word eyes around me, mine start to water, and I started having to rub them. And does anybody else suffer from this? Just any eye kind of thing. I see a picture of an eye, I'm done. So, so, so I'm just weird, thank you. So while I'm excited about tonight's topic, because we're going to be talking about something that's near and dear to my heart, endangered species and wildlife conservation, I also don't know how this program's going to go for me. Check on me every now and then, make sure, you know, I'm, if somebody's got some Visine in the room. They didn't pay me to say that, but they can, <laughs> I think. So tonight, yeah, we're going to talk about... Uh, uh, endangered species conservation, and the, the eyeballs of endangered species, as I gather. But we've got somebody really great for that. We have an ophthalmologist, a veterinary assistant professor from the College of Veterinary Medicine at NC State, which itself uh, is a great place. We are fortunate here in the Triangle to have the College of Veterinary Medicine. Anybody take their animals or had, I mean, I hope you haven't had to go visit the vet, the vet college unless it was for for good reasons, but we have an incredible resource just up the road here in Raleigh at NC State's vet school, and it's even great for us here at the museum because they have such great smart people, and they always share them with us for the Science Cafe. So several times a year, we have guest speakers from CVM coming into the, this space to share their knowledge and passion. Are you ready to get into it? I say we get into it. Please welcome to the stage our guest tonight, Dr. Freya Moet. All right, I've been instructed on how to use the microphone and uh, wave at me if you can't hear me because I have a dulcet tone. Um, if you all fall asleep, I won't be surprised. If you all tune out, I won't be surprised because of my accent. So just think Downton Abbey and uh, ignore everything I said. Um, so I'm very happy to be standing up here. It's actually extremely intimidating as uh, somebody who actually sits on the floor and actually participates in trivia pretty regularly here. I'm a glorious member of the Science Geeks Knot. Um, not terribly... Not terribly participatory. Um, I definitely credit the rest of my teammates for the successes that we've had, um, but certainly a, a very enthusiastic participant. Um, so shout out to them. Um, I am unfortunately a science geek, so I'm sort of a misnomer um, because I really am a passionate scientist. Um, my story is I grew up in um, rural England, so wildlife was actually my in to animals. So um, you know, I really started without pets. My family were horribly allergic to any furry things. So I enjoyed the wildlife in my garden more than I was capable of enjoying my pets. So I really started with hedgehogs and foxes and badgers and all the British wildlife and then went to vet school, um, uh, learned about lots of other species, and then um, moved to the US, did a PhD in the UK, and then moved to the US, and appreciated really how much diversity of wildlife there is here in comparison to the UK. So I just did not know, you know anything about US wildlife and have really been um, kind of joyfully embracing um, you know, what opportunities they are here. And being able to train as a veterinarian and an ophthalmologist is amazing. So human ophthalmologists only train with one species. I get to see everything else. And so we as ophthalmologists see the diversity from a chinchilla to 
to a giraffe to a rhino or, or everything in between. You know, we deal with pet animals, we deal with wildlife species, and we deal with zoo animals on a regular basis. So we're um, really very privileged to be able to almost see evolution in action on a regular basis. So um, this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart as well as uh, Chris's. I promise Chris you can kind of pay attention at the beginning because the eyeballs come later. He's gone. Um, but yes. So we'll start with the story. Um, so this is Short Tail, uh, the red wolf. Um, we're going to start with Short Tail and we're going to go off on a journey and then come back to Short Tail near the end. But Short Tail was my story, my in to the red wolves and how I got to be part of this project. So as a clinical veterinary ophthalmologist, um, people call on me for random eyeballs all the time. And actually, one of our audience members was the, the person who uh, called us up as the ophthalmology service and asked us to look look at short tail. So short tail's keepers were very observant and could pick up on the fact that hopefully you guys can see too, which is that short tail has a weird looking eyeball, right? So his right eye looks a bit cloudy compared with his left eye. And they also noticed that his behavior was a bit weird. So they're captive species, so they're uh, raised in, in, in family groups or in pens. And they were noticing that he was much more hesitant in his pen and he was also not um, uh, comfortable walking around when he was stressed out he would bump into things. So definitely some behavioral changes. So they were worried that perhaps the, the cloudiness of that right eye might be a cataract in his eye and that that might be causing vision problems. So he initially presented to us as a surgery appointment because we thought we might end up being able to treat his vision using uh, cataract surgery. So I'm just going to give you a little wander through the eyeball. Um, hopefully this is schematic enough not to stress out Chris. Um, but you, what you can see on the screen here, if I can get my pointer, is so the air where your eyeball sits is here. So the front of your eye is here. And the brain is sitting back here at the back. So, um, so the front of the eye, everything up until the retina is actually designed to focus light perfectly on the back of the eye. So the cornea is the window, and then the lens is actually, just like the lens in your camera, it's designed to focus the light perfectly on the back of the eye so that the retina gets the most optimal picture of your world. And so if you have cataracts, the lens gets kind of changed, and that changes the opacity, the uh, coloration of the lens, or the, the uh, clarity of the lens, and that's why you get blurry vision when you get cataracts and you need surgery. Surgery. So a surgeon would take out the normal pieces of the lens that you normally have and then would replace it with an artificial lens. So yes, short tail did have a cataract. So he actually, in that bad eye, had a cataract in his lens. But if you guys are observant, you can appreciate that his right eye, sorry, his left eye, um, did not have a cataract. And so when we looked back at his left eye, we could appreciate that he had um, retinal disease. So the retina is really why we have eyeballs, because this is where phototransduction happens. It's where perception of light occurs and our uh, very important sense starts. So there are cells in the retina called the photoreceptors. They help to convert a photon of light into an electrical signal, which gets transferred to the brain via a giant nerve called the optic nerve. So that's your blind spot in the eye if you've ever done those kind of vision tests uh, on, online. Um, and, and so every um, species, really, uh, it, pretty much every species in existence has some form of photoreceptive organ. It's a very, very high priority sense. So for example, humans, about 30% of our brain is dedicated to the processing of visual information. So that's about a third of your brain that's dedicated to this one sense. So it's a really critical survival and success organ. Um, What's really interesting, though, is that at least in humans, the risk of having a genetic abnormality that results in vision problems is pretty high. So you and I, as humans, we have about a one in three to 4,000 uh, chance that one of our offspring will have a genetic problem that causes vision problems. Maybe not complete blindness, but certainly vision problems. And 22%, um, so about one in five of us, carry a, a bad mutation in our genetic code that could result in a problem in our children. So we really do have high risk of vision problems. And we'll talk about why in just a second about, um, uh, about genetic diversity. 
So just a tiny little um, intro to where we're going. Um, so we'll start with um, a little intro to population bottlenecks, a little concept of uh, genetics. And then I'll talk about canids in general. That's a large family of different types of uh, wolf-like species. And then we'll specifically talk a little bit about red wolves. And then I'll take a little journey into why canids are particularly important in the development of understanding and treatment for human blindness. So I've personally had some experience of that through my PhD and postdoc and would love to share with you what your dog has done for human vision, which is quite profound. And then we'll circle back to Mr. Shorttail back at the end and uh, we'll tell you a little bit about his story. Okay, so bottlenecks, a little bit of science here. So if you think about a jar of jelly beans as a large population of animals with great genetic diversity. So you've got lots and lots of different colors of jelly beans, which represents the different diverse uh, members of that population. So any kind of bottlenecking event is essentially when you restrict the number of those jelly beans, so the number of different individuals in a population, and then therefore restrict the diversity of those animals or those uh, people. And so essentially what that does is that any offspring of those small numbers of surviving individuals naturally have a lower diversity of genetic code because there's less, you know, less diversity in the population. So what that does is it really narrows down the, the sort of the survivability of that species because our diversity allows us to be very adaptable to new experiences. Say a new disease comes along, a new predator comes along. The diversity within the species allows us to be able to cope with that. A small number of individuals will have some specific advantage and that might allow those to survive and pass on that survival skill to the next generation. That gets lost when you lose a large number of populations due to a bottlenecking event. So to give you an example of a bottlenecking event, we as humans went through some of that. Um, so it's a, a little tiny bit controversial, but um, many people subscribe to the idea that there was a giant super volcano that came along about 70,000 years ago. It was called the Toba super volcano. And it occurred in Indonesia, so in the middle of uh, Europe and Asia. And essentially it was so big that it caused a dramatic change in the Earth's climate. Um, so if you think about the, um, the Mount St. Helens uh, volcano that erupted a number of years ago, and then multiply that by 2,800 times, so a very large number of proportion higher, and it released such a giant ash cloud that there was substantial climate cooling and an also a lot of ash that fell on the environment. And that substantially reduced the ecosystem underneath that ash cloud, which essentially encompassed all of Europe and Asia. So actually any humans that were in that part of the world perished. And so instead of having a wide diversity of population, the entirety of the human hate race had to be repopulated back from Africa. So that's called the out of Africa bottleneck. And it um, essentially means that we were restricted down to about three to 10,000 humans about 70,000 years ago. And then the entirety of Europe and Asia which is most of us now, um, was really populated from those three to 10,000 individuals. So we are not immune from a bottlenecking event and in fact is probably one of the reasons why we as a human race have a very high risk of genetic conditions because of that lack of diversity. So I wanted to give you kind of a success story before we talk um, about the red wolf, which is a little uncertain. So this little cute creature is the American black-footed ferret. You have probably never seen this in the wild. There are very few in the wild. But this is a native species to the US. It used to be everywhere. It used to be in Mexico, Canada, and all of the 50 states in the US. Um, its prey is the prairie dog. And so unfortunately, back in the mid 20th century, when the prairie dog was seen as an invasive animal for agricultural purposes. The prairie dog was poisoned and trapped and killed. And unfortunately, the black-footed ferret kind of took the brunt of that and really lost most of its prey. The other thing that happened to them was that we, as the human race, introduced um, Yersinia pestis, the plague, into the United States. And unfortunately, that also resulted in some um, significant loss of, of black-footed ferrets as well. They're very susceptible. 
So this poor critter went from being very successful to being very, very unsuccessful in a short period of time and was actually declared extinct in the wild in the mid-20th uh, century. So um, we thought we'd given up, you know, it was, it, was, it was done. But then back in the 1980s, somebody's dog in Wyoming came home with one in its mouth. <laughs> So um, clearly there was a population somewhere and some very clever and insightful biologists went to that location and, and managed to capture 18 um, black-footed ferrets from the wild. And uh, again, very clever people established a captive breeding population. And so from those 18 founders, which is not very many, over 8,500 uh, black-footed ferrets have been born. Um, and they've now actually been reintroduced to over eight, I think eight states in the US and, and Mexico and Canada as well. So there are surviving populations in the US, um, and it really is classified as a success story. So here is, courtesy of the US Fish and Wildlife Service, a delightful picture of a released black-footed ferret um, going back into its home environment uh, somewhere in the US. So really what we can say is that it's, it's now endangered. It used to be extinct, and it's now endangered. So this is at least right now a success story. Now, it's not the end of the story for the black-footed ferret because clearly it's an undiverse population. We know that because of its, um, it, its founder population. So it, it carries some risk that anything new that comes along it has less capability to cope with. Um, so certainly this needs long-term monitoring and, and careful monitoring to, to make sure it survives. But this is kind of the success story that I wanted us all to carry carry forward through this story because I think we could all get quite depressed about the red wolf if we don't think about some successes. So we'll go back to canids. Um, this is the, the kind of diversity of canids, courtesy of Wikipedia. Um, and this uh, canid family um, or originated about six million years ago, so it's a very ancient family. And it includes a lot of different types of uh, wolf-like animals. So you've got wolves, coyotes, uh, dingoes, um, uh, yeah, wild dogs. Um, there's actually, it looks like a raccoon. I promise it's not. It's a raccoon dog, um, which is officially a canid, I promise. So Wikipedia got it right. Um, and, and included in this is your dog. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about your dog for a few minutes here. Um, but it's a, it's a fairly ancient species um, or ancient family of species that includes a lot of different diversity. But here's your dog, <laughs> or at least somebody's dog. Um, and this is what we as humans have done to wolves, which, you know, it's kind of horrifying, really, at the same time as being glorious. Um, you know, and, and dogs as a, as a, as a, a group of can canids um, probably originated about 20 to 40,000 years ago. Um, there were probably multiple simultaneous or semi-simultaneous domestication events. So we as humans, you know, dragged those wolves closer to the fire, fed them scraps, and eventually they gave in and decided that we were okay to live with. Um, but modern breeds like these um, are really only about two to 500 years old. So the ancient, um, you know, dogs that we, we got a few hundred thousand years ago are probably nowhere near what we, we see these days as, as purebred dogs. But what you can imagine is that dogs have undergone some of their own bottlenecking events, both at the time that they were domesticated, 20 to 40,000 years ago, because probably not very many wolves decided to come and hang out by the fire. And secondly, as we created those up to 400 different types of purebred dogs that we have now. So if you really look at your pug carefully, you'll probably understand how undiverse it is as a genetic being. Um, so that's sort of a negative and also positive because we think they're all quite delightful and cute. But it also means that they are quite highly susceptible to genetic conditions. So um, dogs are second only to humans in their risk of inherited disease. Um, there are about 750 described known inherited diseases in dogs compared with about 25,000 in humans. So we're nowhere near um, the risk that we have. But what that creates is the opportunity for understanding disease through our companions. And so a lot of people in veterinary medicine really have uh, channeled that into their research, including myself. Um, so really about 400 of those 750 um, uh, inherited conditions are direct models for humans. And so that can help us learn about disease and actually treat disease as well. 
So this is, uh, this is Tasha. So the, this is the first dog that ever had its genome sequenced. So Tasha the boxer, she's a little uh, heavy set, but she's a very, very sweet individual, I understand. Um, so she had her genome sequenced back in 2004. So she was the fifth mammal, including humans, to have her genome sequenced at the cost of $30 million. Um, so you can kind of understand why, because you know, we, we know now that they're highly susceptible to inherited conditions, so they're very useful models. But $30 million, lots of people, um, 2.4 million bases were sequenced in little short segments of 700 bases. So a lot of work for a lot of people. But back in 2004, the first dog genome was published, and that really opened up the opportunity for genetic um, uh, disease understanding in dogs. And what that did was create the opportunity for dogs like Lancelot. So this is Lancelot. He's a Briard, or he was a Briard. I apologize. He's uh, no longer with us. Um, but he was the first dog, apart from a service dog, to visit Congress. Why did Lancelot visit Congress? I, I'm sure you're asking. So <laughs> Lancelot visited Congress because he had an inherited disease that caused blindness in his eyes. And he was treated with a pioneering therapy which rescued his blindness. So he was given a replacement gene that gave, gave him back the function that he lacked due to his genetic mutation. And that genetic mutation is identical or almost identical to disease causing mutations in humans. So Lancelot led directly to this person here and multiple others. So back in 2008, when I was a lowly PhD student, um, I got to hang out with some people who were actually treating humans with gene therapy. So they were injecting viruses into the eye that encoded the genetic code that gave back humans a product that they didn't have and making people see again. So I got to hear this lovely young man's story. He was an awkward teenager at the time and he couldn't walk down the street to his band practice because he couldn't see well at night. After the therapy, he said he had confidence and he could meet girls and kind of go and play in his band. So really, you got to really feel feel the power of not only the ability to treat humans, but how animals and dogs allowed us to get there. And, and without the dog, we would never have been there. The eye was the first place to do gene therapy um, because of the natural animal models that we had. So we're going to go back to, to other canids now, and we're going to just touch, because I'm sure someone's going to have this question, we're going to touch on the controversy associated with red wolves. I can't, it's the elephant in the room, I can't not mention it. So there are people who do not believe that the red wolf is a unique species. Um, and you know there are people who strongly believe that it is a unique species. I am staying Switzerland on that um, at the moment, but I have to acknowledge that there are there are a range of different animals that the red wolf is related to. So the two most closely related species are the coyote and the gray wolf. Now there are behavioral evidences that red wolves act more like wolves than they do like coyotes. So coyotes tend to ha uh, act singly and they tend to hunt singly and then tend to eat small prey like rodents and rabbits. Red wolves, just like gray wolves, tend to pack, and they're also quite a bit larger than coyotes, and they tend to um, uh, eat kind of larger prey as a consequence. Morphologically, so kind of skull size and shape, they definitely have some differences between coyotes, but they also have some differences to gray wolves as well. So there are three main hypotheses. Sorry, this is probably quite a small slide for those of you at the back of the room, but there are three hypotheses about the uh, species origins of the red wolf. So if you just orient yourself, Latrans, which is in green, that's coyotes, and then lupus is, uh, is gray wolves, and then RW is red wolf, and then EW is the eastern wolf, which some, um, that is, a, is a population of very similar looking wolves to red wolves that reside up in the southern part of eastern Canada. Um, and so there are really sort of three schools of thought. There's people who really think that there's two species. There's coyotes and gray wolves. And the red wolf and the eastern wolf kind of fall into the, mostly into the gray wolf category. Maybe some kind of connection up with the coyote hybridization wise, but they're fundamentally gray wolves. Then there's the three species hypothesis, which is where at some point in the past, the red wolf and the eastern wolf separated off 
predominantly from the coyote and became a separate set of species on their own. So there's three different species. And then there's the four species hypothesis where in, uh, you have both the red wolf and the eastern wolf being separate uh, species. So uh, definitely controversy, um, but what I will say is that the National Academy of Sciences has recently studied this. So they were asked to uh, really look at the status of uh, both the Mexican wolf and the red wolf, and their conclusion based on a number of scientific lines of inquiry was that there is currently evidence that supports the unique species status for the red wolf. So what that means is I get to carry on doing my research because it's still a species. Because if it lacked being a species, we would then potentially be working on a gray wolf, red wolf, uh, gray wolf, uh, coyote hybrid, and nobody would really get very excited about keeping it um, healthy. So we'll kind of put a line under that and go back to Mr. Shorttail. So now you can understand why he's called Shorttail, right? <laughs> he's not the most photogenic, unfortunately, poor guy. Um, so, so back to Shorttail and his blindness problem. You know, so suddenly we've got an endangered species. There's less than 300 of these in the in the country, um, and we've got a blindness, which I've kind of led you towards the concept that could be genetic, right? He's undergone a bottleneck. These guys were founded in the 1970s from about 12 rescued individuals. So there are 300 currently, but there's a small number of founder animals. So that bottlenecking event occurred. And so it's highly possible that this blindness, knowing that blindness is inherited in other canids and in humans, um, could well be genetic. So, um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we've discovered with the blindness for the next few minutes, and then we'll take some questions. But I need to orient you on a bit of canid eyeball anatomy. So I guess Chris, look away now if you have any squeamishness. He's watering. I can see him. Um, so uh, it's all schematic. You'll be fine. Um, so a couple of uh, pieces of unique anatomy that different species have that we don't. So the first piece is that uh, animals that live in dim light environments have a reflector, just like a reflector you have on your bicycle. They have that at the back of the eye. And the purpose of that, at least the conceptual purpose, is that it reflects any unused photons of light back through the retina, so the retina gets a second chance at the light. That gives you an enhancement of the sensitivity of the retina to the light and gives you a better chance of seeing a photon of light. So that structure is called the tapetum, and it's reflective. So if you catch a deer in your headlights, um, you'll see that reflection, that green color. That's the tapetum, so now you all know. Uh, the other piece I'll point out is the optic nerve. So like I said, that's your blind spot in the eye, and that's the nerve that carries all the information from the retina to the brain, and that gives you the visual perception that you can see consciously. And then the last piece I'll point out is the retinal blood vessels. So blood vessels provide nutrition, and they also remove debris and, and metabolites from the, the eye. The eye is extremely metabolically active, so it's consuming oxygen all the time. So there's a very extensive blood vessel network that's visible when we look at the back of the eye. So we imagine that we're looking kind of at the face of the retina, kind of through the pupil, through the eye, and that's the kind of view we'll get. So the next picture is real animals. So the animal on the left-hand side there is a normal uh, red wolf. And so I'll point out a few key structures there. So the arrowhead points to the optic nerve. So hopefully you can appreciate that that optic nerve looks kind of gray, pinkish color. It's quite triangular shaped. But compare that with the arrowhead in the blind red wolf on the right-hand side. So you've got a very dark, almost black-colored optic nerve, and you've got some uh, rounding of that optic nerve compared with the shape in the, in the normal wolf. So that suggests that we've got some substantial degeneration of that nerve that transmits the information from the eye to the brain. And that would explain some of the reason why we've got some blindness. The other piece to this is that you've got less blood vessels, so hopefully you can appreciate it almost looks like a tree with some tree branches coming up off the top and then some tree roots coming off the bottom of the optic nerve in the normal red wolf. And then in the blind wolf, you can barely see the tree, it's so tiny. And that's because there's no need for the blood vessels because the retina is dying. There's, there's a degeneration of the retina which feeds a degeneration of the blood vessels. And then the final piece is that tapetum. So if you imagine the tapetum like a mirror, you're shining a, a flashlight at that mirror, 
the retina is like a piece of tissue paper that sits over the mirror. So if you imagine you're shining that light at the mirror, the tissue paper is going to dull the reflection coming back at that mirror at you. Um, whereas if the tapetum, if the retina is degenerated, then you're going to see more of that reflection coming back because you've taken the tissue paper away. So hopefully you can appreciate in the blind wolf on the uh, right hand side that there's areas that look really bright and shiny in the middle there. And that's because there's less retina in the way and that's caused the degenerate, uh, the, um, the reflection to become brighter. So to represent the disease in a different way, we were very lucky that donations of eyeballs came from all over the country. So when red wolves have passed away, I get a little package in the mail, which is interesting. Um, <laughs> but we send some of these off to our pathologists at the vet school, and they take sections of these tissues, and then we're able to look and really detailed examine uh, the, the, the pathology of the disease. And so hopefully you can appreciate the thickness of this tissue. So you've got retina that's starts up here in the normal red wolf and ends down here, compared with really probably about a third of the thickness in the affected wolf, the bad uh, disease wolf. And, and I'll just point your attention to this little thin layer here. So these cells, these little dots, these are the cells of the photoreceptors. And then where phototransduction happen, where you perceive light, is this little layer here. That's the outer segments of the photoreceptors. And hopefully you can all appreciate that they're just isn't that layer in, the, in the, the abnormal wolf. So really we're seeing significant degeneration of that truly essential tissue, the photoreceptor layer in these wolves. And so it's no wonder that they're blind. So this picture is supposed to remind me to tell you about pedigrees. And it's a, a sort of strange picture to show. But the reason for that is that the word pedigree is derived from pied de gru, which is a French word or French phrase for um, a, a leg of a crane or a foot of a crane. So hopefully you can see that this crane, James Audubon's picture, has kind of a, a, a kind of divergent toe structure, a little splayed toe structure, which essentially is what a pedigree looks like. So if you look at these parents here, you've got a father who's a square, you've got a mother who's a circle, and then here's the leg and here's the foot of the crane. So Pierre de maybe a trivia question sometime, you never know. Um, so we've got three generations of pedigree represented here. So we've got grandparents, and then we've got parents, and then we've got children. And so a marriage or a union, uh, it doesn't always have to be a marriage if you're not a human, um, but a, a marriage is represented by a horizontal line and then a vertical line means offspring. And so obviously then there's divergent groups of, uh, of, of different offspring. So this is a normal pedigree that we would see in any of our families. Unfortunately, when we come to animals, we tend to find that animals breed a little bit more promiscuously than humans do. So we tend to find that there are these strange relationships that start popping up that we would never see in our own, or hopefully very rarely see in our own world. So uh, this would be you know, a grandparent-grandchild union, which clearly would be not appropriate, um, but happens you know, all too commonly in animal breeding. So um, what I will tell you is that, and one of our students who's here in the room can tell you this, that we crashed many pedigree programs that were designed for human pedigrees because the red wolf is so inbred um, that we really had to revert to a different method of pedigree analysis to, to humans just because we would have sort of, you know, the computer was basically like, this is too much. <laughs> Um, but we will show you briefly um, just the tiny breakdown of Short Tail's pedigree. So this is just the mini pedigree of his mum and dad and him and his brother. So what you can immediately see, I'll just go back just for a second. So when you get those strange unions um, that really aren't, there are related unions, you get a double line that's created. So that means essentially that the parents of an offspring are related to each other, which means that there's inbreeding or that, that bottlenecking event. So what you can hopefully appreciate immediately by looking at Short Tail's pedigree is that there's a double line here between his parents. And that means they're not grandfather, grandbaby, but they are um, about second cousins in terms of their relatedness to each other because of that bottlenecking event. So um, Short Tail being affected with the disease has a black coloration, and he's the, the first one we saw. So he has a little, a little um, uh, sign there as well, a little arrow. Um, and then we were able to fill in the rest of his pedigree by me kind of driving around the country looking at various different wolves. And so we could find that uh, his brother also has the disease. 
and his father also has the disease. And his mother is somewhere in between, but probably isn't affected. So really, this is a very intensely affected pedigree um, compared with most genetic uh, diseases. We've got a lot of individuals affected. Hopefully, you'll also appreciate that there's a high propensity of males that get this disease. And I'll just show you, just to kind of blow your mind, this is one of the pieces of the pedigree um, of the animals that we've looked at so far. So instead of having all the double lines, these are all crossed over lines because of the number number of crossbreedings there are between different individuals and it definitely didn't quite crash the program but it certainly looks more like a petty web than a pedigree. Um, the crane would have some polydactyly I suspect or multiple toes. <laughs> um, but so the individuals at the top they're the, um, the founders so there's 12 of those and then the individuals who are black are the affected wolves and then the gray ones are the ones that I've managed to go look at and are unaffected. So hopefully again just from a 20,000 foot view, you can appreciate there are a lot more squares than circles. So the relationship between males and females is about 5.5 to 1. Um, so we are suspicious that this disease carrying mutation, if it is a genetic condition, which we strongly suspect it is, um, is actually carried on the X chromosome. So X chromosome um, is, is the sex chromosome or one of the sex chromosomes and females carry two copies of the X chromosome and males only carry one because the other sex chromosome is the Y chromosome. And so when we have some mutation on the X chromosome, it's more likely to be showing up in males because they only have one copy. So if they inherit by accident a bad copy, then they are more likely to get a disease, whereas females have that kind of backup X chromosome. So it would make sense kind of um, genetically that this is X-linked, um, and that's our current line of thinking, and we're working on the genetics kind of with funding at the moment. So I'll leave you with short tail story, um, you know, and, and I'm happy to kind of take questions in just a few minutes. But really, my concern as a as a biologist and as a veterinarian is it's important that we figure this stuff out because if the red wolf is to survive and it's to be released like the black footed ferret, I would have a hard time sleeping at night knowing that there may be blind wolves born in the wild because I would imagine that those wolves will have a hard time eating they would have a hard time finding a mate, and therefore they may suffer. You know, they may, the species may suffer and the individuals may suffer as well. So I do feel like it's my mission, um, you know, not just as a veterinarian and as an ophthalmologist, but really as, a, as an ecologist to try and uh, figure this out so that we can try and keep this species more successful in the future. It's going to be a mammoth effort, but I think it's very much worth it. So um, I wouldn't be here without the family. Um, so there's a lot of people in the room that have uh, contributed to this work, including Philip and uh, um, Emma and, and various other people. And then at NC State University, Dr. KS, who's also in the room, and then the SSP managers. There's a group of people who meet every year in various locations in the US just to discuss this species and keep it healthy. Um, there are US fish and wildlife biologists who have dedicated their entire careers to this species. Um, and there are scientists who deeply care about this species as well. So um, without all of the collaborators and connections that we've developed, I wouldn't be able to stand up here and tell you a little bit about my work. Um, we've also been very lucky to get some funding for this work through NC State and also through a charitable foundation. And so there, I'm very grateful for those as well. And with that, I will be very happy to answer any questions. All right. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, if you're maybe new to the cafe or haven't been here in a while, the way Q&A works, I've got a microphone. Katie has one there in the back. Wave at us. We'll bring you a microphone. Uh, that way everybody in the room can hear. Please use the microphones. Uh, and we'll get to as many questions as we can, and we'll tend to alternate back and forth. So I'm going to get the first one right here in the front. Okay. Well, I have a friend. Uh he was, he came three months early. His mother went into labor six months. When he was born back in 52, they, he had to be placed in an incubator. But today they can control the amount of oxygen the baby gets at any one specific moment in time better than they could back in 52. But the thing of it was, at one point, he, get, he asked that they got too much oxygen in, and it caused wetting in the back of both of his eyes to, be, to get burned. And combined with carbon burning the retina, both are causing him to go blind. 
Now, he's normally, he has a ministry called Spoken Word Ministry. So he's a graduate of Carolina and Duke, and so he's living, a, he's married, happily married, living a normal life. His children are basically grown now. But the question I'm asking is, is there any chance that his retinas could ever be re repaired where he could see again? Oh, that's a mammoth question, right? So firstly, I'll preface that disease is not inherited. So that's called retinopathy of prematurity, and it is a condition that's associated with prematurity. So when we're born premature, the environment in the uterus is relatively low in oxygen. So as soon as we're born prematurely, that oxygen environment changes the retina messes it up, and then we develop our retina postnatally abnormally. So he is, his children are not at risk of having no. inherited disease. But your question is, is there a future for his retina that could be yeah, able to replace him? Sure. So gene therapy would not help him because he doesn't have a gene mutation that causes his blindness. But there are people working on a couple of different, like non-specific, non-genetic ways to rescue vision. It's such an important sense. So people are working on stem cells. So they're actually working on the ability to take a skin cell, convert it in tissue culture to being a retinal cell, and then grow you a new retina in the dish and then stick it back in your eye. So those are stem cell therapists. You know, it's coming at some point in our lifetimes. Probably we'll be able to replace the retina with, uh, with new cells. Other people are working at using new photosensitive dyes to get them into different parts of the retina that are not dying and then kind of key into the network of biology that's still present in the eye and essentially convert a non-photoreceptor into a photoreceptor. So that's kind of amazing, kind of almost like, you know, rewiring the retina. Um, and then there are other people who are working on mechanical ways, so chip-based technology where you can implant a tiny, tiny chip that keys in again to some of the, the electrical wiring in the eye and sends a CCD image, like a video image, from your vision, from your eye, to the brain electrically instead of through your photosensitive organs. So there are three current main lines of thought exactly along that concept. Instead of treating one specific type of blindness, we may be able to treat very non-specifically. And there are parallel you know, uh, uh, lines of evidence that, that that will work. Good question. Yeah. Uh, two questions. Uh, uh, first of all, what's the molecular uh, change in these red wolves, do you know? Ha, and, and do not know. Yeah. Don't know. Okay. Then, then the second question is more a philosophical question that you discussed toward the end. That, that you worry about these red wolves going out and being blind. So, so what, what about just the, the, the hard-nosed Darwinian approach to that, that they won't breed, they'll, they'll die, and the better ones will survive? Right, right, right. I mean, I think my, my concept is if we can, while they're still in captivity, if we can figure out what the molecular diagnosis is, which is our main research mission right now, then we can essentially slowly breed away from the mutation so that the wolves we send out into the wild have low or no risk of having that mutation be causative. So uh, we can't do it quickly because obviously, based on our pedigree evidence, it's a high frequency of disease. So we have to be very selective about breeding because we can't just not breed anybody who has that mutation because we'd have no animals to breed with, right? So we have to do it probably over maybe 50 generations. So it's going to be a long-term effort. A, Dar a simple Darwinian, a Darwinian would just wipe out the species. It would probably wipe out the species okay. would be my assumption. I mean, I think, um, I think that would probably happen based on the frequency that we think this disease is a risk in this group of animals. I think it's highly possible, um, you know, that we would essentially kill them off. Um, you know, and maybe some Darwinians in the room would say, well, so be it, but, you know, that's, that's a, it would be a crying shame, you know, to lose a native species. So I'm curious, and it's in line with what you were just saying, what's communication like between your lab, your research, and, say, the species survival plan, uh, the stud book keepers and the people making their recommendations for how to continue to breed right. the species knowing the pedigree? So I have had zero, I purposefully had zero influence on breeding decisions at this point because my idea, there's, there's so little diversity already that I can't provide sufficient genetic counseling based on my current evidence to know 
where and how to breed away from this. Um, the more animals I look at, the more confident I will become that there will be individuals that are much less likely to have this in their you know, in their genes. Um, and I've provided maybe a little bit of information. Oh, he's relatively unrelated. He's related. She's related. But, you know, I, anybody who can breed should breed because there's already some issues in the species with low litter sizes, low viability of pups. Um, you know, there's some issues with, um, with fertility. So if we start then also making some, you know, some decisions on who to breed, we may already create the collapse of the species because it really is quite at risk. So right now I'm making no genetic counseling advice. I provide information and, you know, we know who's affected, who's unaffected, and we can start talking about that. But it, until we get close enough to a molecular um, diagnosis, so a, a gene that's mutated and a test that we can literally run through through, you know, multiple individuals and test them for it. I don't think it's fair to start making those types of decisions for the species. Question I, right there. I think you just answered my question. Um, it had to do with like if when when the onset of the disease, if, when you actually visualize it. So yeah, and so you can, you can keep it, them from breeding. A so. really good question, and we've been very careful. To, to, to not be too biased in that. Um, some animals, we picked it up very early. So the youngest animal I've seen it in is about, uh, myself, is about 2.8 years old, which is clearly around breeding age. But actually, some older studies have been done back in the 90s, and they found it in less than a year old animal. And so in theory, you know, I think it could be very young. But there are also some animals that have successfully bred in captivity that have the disease, and we haven't really noticed it. So what I've done when we've made those decisions on who's affected and who's unaffected, especially from a genetic standpoint, is to really look at the super old wolves. So I can be absolutely confident that they're definitively affected or definitively not affected. Um, there's going to be some gray in, you know, they're wild animals. They get exposed to kind of things that might damage their retinas, and we see some small changes. We don't know in some of those animals whether they're going to go on and get the disease and it's just early stages or whether it's just random kind of changes that we see as a natural um, disease on its own. So from, from a practical, practical side, I don't know how easy it is to handle the wolves if you just want to look when they're young and see what you can see at right. time, right? Yeah, it's, um, it's a labor of love looking at every individual wolf. I mean, um, my collaborators will speak to the number of miles we have driven. Um, we've had a lot of podcasts um, played and a lot of conversations had. Uh, these wolves are placed in very small groups in multiple locations within the United States. There's actually no federal funding or very little, there's a little bit of federal funding, but very little federal funding to support the species survival. So zoos and collections that support these animals do it out of the kindness of their own hearts and personal donations from, from patrons. And therefore there's no centralized place where like a red wolf breeding program exists. There's a few places that have a lot, but not very many. And so I personally, if I want to go and look at wolf X, often have to drive, you know, I drove to Mississippi, we've been up to Columbia, South Carolina, um, Tennessee. And, and the other thing that happens is because of the wolf dating game to try and keep the diversity of the species going, every year there's a big switch around like a speed dating event that happens actually right around this sort of time. Um, they, they move the wolves around because obviously what you don't want is the same pair to keep breeding and breeding and breeding and then, you know, it's just one little tiny genetic group that continues. So I often end up chasing them around the country just to try and see a single individual. So right now I'm actually focusing on the old wolves because they're the most informative for my research because I can definitively say those wolves are not affected, those wolves are affected, let's look at the genetic code of those wolves. Um, but I think in the future we're going to start looking at younger wolves to start really defining the age of onset and start looking at that, that concept as well. <coughs> Question? Hey, Freya. Hello. Yeah. Uh oh. Um, <laughs> um, in terms of your vision for how the population could return to uh, a healthy, sustainable level, does that, incorporate, does that incorporate a notion of implementing gene therapy in the same way as the black-footed ferret? Because you mentioned 50 generations, and that 
Well, that's a the, lot of generations. Yeah, that seems yeah. like a lot of generations in a human yeah, perspective. I mean, and, and I just ask because I feel like if you could do that, then you could keep this gene around but treat it, yep. and that would let you prioritize other other factors when, when trying to breed right. the wolves. And this comes into some sort of um, quite controversial concepts. Um, if you do gene therapy in a human, you're gene therapying an eyeball gene. You're not gene therapying a gene that's going to be transmitted to somebody's offspring. So, you know, that's kind of eugenics and uh, has its own kind of concept uh, of, of, of difficulty. So that human that can see again still has the risk of passing that gene mutation onto its babies. So if we did gene therapy on wolf X, it's still not going to fix the gene mutation in its offspring. So the only place that gene therapy, I think, has a position is if we do gene editing. And we would have to do gene editing at the the gamey, you know, the, the, the reproductive level. And that, I mean, there are world committees on that as a concept because it has so much ethical implication. Because if we can edit, you know, wolf genomes and make them less susceptible to genetic conditions, awesome. But we could also make everybody blue-eyed and white, you know, and that, that concept scares governments and countries and, you know, large uh, groups of people. So I think we're a long way from authorizing that type of technology to be used. I mean, I'm sure it will get used, whether it's authorized or not. Um, but certainly, I think we're going to be a long way from that right now. Hey, um, what kind of advice would you give to someone who's interesting uh, in pursuing a career similar to yours? Like, what kind of oh. majors should I be looking at? Wow, that's a good question. Um, my journey was very long and uh, arduous, I guess, and I, I mean, wonderful. I really enjoyed it, but I did not have a life journey that said, I'm going to be a veterinary ophthalmologist and I'm going to stand up on this stage and do this. So what I would tell you is enjoy the journey and don't regret any decisions you make because it will take you in awesome directions. Um, my journey was I wanted to be a vet. That was my first love. Um, and in the UK, we do vet school as a single degree. So I'm a bachelor's of veterinary science rather than a doctor of veterinary medicine. Um, I'm still a doctor because I got the PhD. But um, I came through veterinary medicine and then found ophthalmology and then found science and then became you know, a researcher. So I, I think everybody's story is different, and I think just follow your, follow your passions. You know, follow what you really enjoy, and you'll find what you like. Does that help? That doesn't yeah. give you a lot of specific advice, but. We've got time for a couple more, and I know there were some more hands that went right. up. The sighted wolves do they treat the unsighted any differently? Do they notice that anything's <laughs> different? Because animals will sometimes yep, pick on those. Yeah, they can those. sense up. Um, you know, the two that I've worked most closely with live on their own. They're brothers, and they live close to each other. Um, I don't know specifically about their behavior um, with each other, but they have... They live relatively close to each other and don't have any issues with aggression, which I would imagine two males mm -hmm. in a different world might. So perhaps it reduces aggression. But I have heard, so the Durham Museum of Life and Sciences had a blind wolf. And they said that the other wolves helped him. So they kind of, he would follow them. He would always be kind of tail to nose with another wolf. And he would kind of just kind of sniff his way around. And they would kind of help him kind of navigate through the, through the pen. So, and, and also your diagram of the eye, there was a part that said ciliary body. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, could you explain that? What the ciliary body is, gosh, well, I mean, this is like ophthalmology anatomy. The ciliary body is a, a couple of things. It creates the fluid that's produced within our eye that helps to keep our eye inflated. Otherwise, if we didn't continuously produce fluid, our eye would kind of shrivel up like a, like a prune, right? So we're constantly producing fluid and we're constantly releasing fluid from the eye to maintain a sort of sensible pressure inside the eye that keeps everything in the right place, but it doesn't overinflate and it doesn't shrivel down. So when you get glaucoma, which which is a common condition in humans, the pressure goes up inside the eye. And it's not because the ciliary body produces too much fluid. It's because the drain of the eye gets clogged. So it's like the drain in your tub. So if you think about the ciliary body like the tap, 
and then the, the drain of the eye is like the drain in your tub. If you've had um, you know, normal amounts of, of tap water, but your, drug, your plug's uh, full of hair, then you're gonna fill up the tub, and that's the same concept. So the ciliary body has that function, and then it also helps to move the lens, so it helps us to focus. So if you're looking at something far away, and then you move your position of focus closer to you when you're reading a book, the ciliary body helps, that muscle helps to kind of move the lens uh, in, in its position so it, can, um, so it can focus appropriately. So it's kind of an amazing piece of the eyeball. Not my personal love, but you know, everyone's got to have favorites. Question. Um, I was wondering if there's a way of introducing uh, artificial genetic variation, and I was thinking of uh, CRISPR. CRISPR-Cas? Was that what you were saying? Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's really where I was going with the answer to Chris's question was um, CRISPR-Cas and gene editing technology is, it's not there yet even to be able to do it in concept, at least as far as we know. It's quite easy to edit genes in a dish, um, but the efficiency has to be very high for us to do it in an animal or in a tissue because you have to be able to get as many of the cells as possible, especially in a degenerative condition like this, you have to hit those cells early and you have to hit those cells effectively. Otherwise, the tissue will still degenerate despite your treatment. I don't think we're there yet, but there are definitely people working on CRISPR-Cas technology in the treatment of inherited blindness for humans. Um, you know, I think in concept of the red wolf, we'd have to be talking about gene editing at the at the, the game eat level, which I think has a whole other set of, uh, of challenges. But yes, CRISPR-Cas would be a wonderful, a wonderful solution for, for the individual. Does that answer your question? Okay. Hi, I wanted to know um, the Eastern Red Wolf and the Mexican Wolf, how close are they in their genetic makeup and is there any interbreeding between them and would that in any way be a way out for the eastern red wolf? Right, uh, I mean, the, so there's two red wolves related species. There's the eastern wolf, which lives up in Canada, and then there's the red wolf, which historically lived down south, so Louisiana, Texas, North Carolina, Florida, all the way up the east coast. And it's quite possible that those two ranges, the eastern wolf and the red wolf, actually interconnected at some point. And so that's where the two, uh, three species hypothesis comes in, right, that they were all one thing at one point. The Mexican wolf historically was in the Mexican, like, western side. Um, and we've got a mountain range that kind of separated those two species so I don't actually know a whole lot about the actual like genetics of the Mexican wolf um, but my my hypothesis would be in this correct me if I'm wrong if anyone's in the room but my hypothesis would be that the Mexican wolf would be more closely related to the gray wolf compared with the, the red wolf um, because their habitats were so separate um, it, uh, back in the days, but the, the Mexican wolf is as endangered, if not more endangered, than the red wolf. Um, and, and I know for sure that they actually probably also have an inherited form of blindness as well. Um, so I think they probably deal with some of the same challenges. I think, you know, there are some people who truly wonder whether red wolves need to outbreed uh, to be successful in the long term. And I, I, I think that there are people who buy into that concept that we're all hybrids of some description or another, right? We've all interbred with other species at some point in our history. So why not use it as a way to maintain diversity and keep a, a, a piece of the species alive? And actually the red wolf has kind of done that on its own because they've just found red wolf DNA in a population of wolves in Texas. So back in uh, on an island, Galveston Island in Texas, they found some red wolf um, genetics in a group of what were mostly coyote but they had a kind of red wolf-like appearance. And so I think the red wolf has perhaps allowed itself to be successful by utilizing hybridization. And, and so, you know, you could, we could debate for a while about whether that still makes it a species or whether it's a hybrid and we don't care about it anymore. But I think that, you know, that there are success stories from, from conservation where they've had to outbreed to a related but similar uh, species and have saved that species by doing so. And so I, I think that's something that probably at some point may need to be considered. Yeah, question. Do you have any estimate as to how much longer it will be before you identified the genetic defect? Oh. <laughs> 
I, I know that's that's tough. Yeah, no. Uh, well, we've got we've you know we've got some information. Um, we are working our way through. There are so few individuals, and they're so closely related that dissecting out this um, genetically is going to be a lot more difficult than my naive kind of you know, idealistic person thought of when, when we first started this project. The other problem is that the X chromosome is kind of like a black hole. Um, there are only a certain number of genes that have been truly well characterized, and most of the X chromosome is this kind of desert of unknown. And so I think, you know, we've got 2.4 billion bases in the genetic code, and so few of those are actually understood. And so it may well be that we know what the mutation is, we found it, but we don't know what it does. And so um, I think we are going to face some significant challenges as we move forward. And, and finances are always an issue. Um, unfortunately, finances are particularly an issue for this species because there are so many scientists that buy into the two species hypothesis that we've had grants rejected and grants unreviewed because they don't think it's worth it, you know. So I think that the science has a hard time moving forward quickly because of that. So I would hope, um, you know, we'll certainly get um, some publication out for the the description of the disease, and then the genetics will will really just have to keep working. I think hopefully within the next couple of years. Question: Do the red wolves have a scientific name? They do. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what? Does anyone want to guess what the? It's a canis. Can you guess? What does red, does anyone know what the Latin name for red is? There's some hands in the air. Rufus, yeah, Canis Rufus. Yep, yep, so Canis familiaris is, can, is, the, is our pet dogs because they're familiar, um, but Canis Rufus is the, is the red wolf. Cool. One more round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great stuff. Conservation can be complicated, can't it? Yeah, but I'm glad that there's smart people working on it, right? And coming at it from all angles, right? Thinking about all of the layers, all of the things, at least we hope that we can address, attack, think, and learn about in order to do endangered species conservation to the best of our ability. So thanks for coming out tonight. I hope that you learned something new. You got something to think about on the drive home at least. Tell all your friends to come to the Science Cafe and family, if you like them, to come to the Science Cafe. Uh, let's see, next Thursday night is August 22nd, and we're doing Black Holes with astrophysicist Katie Mack. Astro Katie on Twitter, if you're familiar. She's a little bit popular on Twitter. So it ought to be a big night. We're gonna have a lot of fun. She's incredible, love Katie. That program is next Thursday night, 7 o'clock, here in the Daily Planet Cafe. And if you like such things, uh, there we do another lecture series Wednesdays at noon. So if you're near downtown and want to take your lunch here at the museum, in the Daily Planet Theater, the big globe-shaped theater, we do a weekly lecture similar to this program uh, where we invite guests in. That program's a lot of fun. You've got the schedule for that one coming up on the tables. That's the purple card that you've got. And hey, tomorrow night, if you like such things, is Natural Selections here at the museum. It's our Science of Beer event. There's still a few tickets available. We've got more than 20 breweries coming out with more than 50 different brews you can taste. And yours truly is doing a live science show as part of it. So if anything, just come see me. No, and have a great time. We've got Science of Beer activities all over the museum. That's in the older building of the museum. Tickets are 40 bucks. You get it's going to be a great party. We have a great time, lots of science, and lots of great local folks. Thanks for coming out. We'll see you again next time. Good night, everybody. <laughs>